Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our colloquium, day four. Uh, happy St. Patty's Day, by the way. And we're continuing on this theme for today, which is leadership and innovation. And we have Dr. Uh, Zemendorf here, and uh, she actually, while you may say leadership and innovation, um, innovation is always, uh, you know, doing something a more creative way too, right? And, and, and the techniques that she's going to talk about today also uh, promote uh, leadership qualities in individuals if they can adhere to some of the practices and suggestions that, that she's discovered in her research. So uh, Dr. Zemendorf works over at United States University. She's the assistant dean over there in the school, uh, or they actually they're called colleges over there in the College of, um, of Nursing and Health Sciences. And she has a lot of experience in this topic uh, related to policy adherence, and leveraging communication. I think the key word there is leveraging, right? Leveraging these, these two items, communication and policy adherence in order to achieve a specific goals, right? Uh, using those as, as a leader to promote movement forward for the initiatives that need to be completed in stuff that, for example, Amanda is responsible for or any of us um, and in, in particular, she probably will contextualize this within nursing professionals and nursing organizations, I'm guessing. So, uh, Dr. Zemendorf, I'll get out of the way and just let you take over. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Thrasher. Um, I'm so happy to be here today and get the chance to talk with you about one of my favorite topics. It hasn't always been one of my favorite topics. I think that there is a point in many professionals' lives and careers where we hear policy and communication, and there are other reactions besides joyous um, excitement. But I will say that it's something that we all have to do. And so if I have to do something, I try to find a way to find joy and fulfillment in it. And I can sincerely say that I have. This is one of my favorite topics. So um, today our objectives are identifying strategic opportunities. We want to demonstrate goal-oriented approaches to communication, um, application of policy, which can be difficult, but I can give you some strategies to make this really easy. Um, identify concepts for alignment between communication and strategy, and then establish a personal plan. The last one's important because we don't want to lose our own identity when we communicate with people. And we also don't want our communication to always come off as cold or, um, or just very general, especially when it comes to our stakeholders like students or external parties. Um, as I begin this presentation, I want to say that if you are present and you're a student, that there is information in this that you can, um, that you can use in your practice as well. The focus of the presentation is for leaders and for organizations, but we're all leaders of our own journey. And so I'll say that these things are adaptable um, to many different scenarios. So I may make mention of that as well as we move through this. <clears throat> so a little about me, I am the uh, Assistant Dean at USU for the College of Nursing and Health Sciences, as Dr. Thrasher mentioned. I previously led a large doctor of nursing practice program. And in the clinical setting, I've um, had experience as a chief nursing officer, clinical educator. And then whenever I was an RN, um, prior to becoming a nurse practitioner, I served in the ICU, the neonatal ICU, and um, also just other many medical surgical units. So um, I'm really excited to have had all those opportunities, and I found that in every one of them, communication has been a factor, and I've learned something different in each place about communication. Um, this topic is important to me, and it becomes integrated in almost all of my professional projects. I did some work before the pandemic um, with other colleagues on supporting veterans in the online format and also um, supporting creating meaningful experiences and online courses. And so <clears throat> a lot of my focus has been in um, asynchronous environments or for distance education. Um, and that in those cases, I think communication is arguably even more difficult and more important because people don't always hear you in your voice whenever they read your communication. Um, so that will be part of the discussion today. I do live in Mesa. I like to hike. I like to travel. 
I like to golf, although I'm very poor at it, um, <laughs> but I still like to do it. And I love sports. I like to watch all kinds of sports. So um, that is all I will say about me. Um, this was just the general overview of the presentation. We're gonna talk about our goals when we communicate and how to leverage different tools that we have at our um, disposal. A lot of things that we already um, can take an assessment of what's available to us and then how we take all of these things and pull them together to align with the organizational mission. So we'll start with what do we know about strategic communication? As we move through this, there will be some opportunities for you to share some things about, you know, either fear or, you know, difficult scenarios you've experienced. So as we start to talk, think about things you might be willing to share, of course, in a, in a de-identified capacity. Um, some people may undervalue this. Uh, we've heard strategic, we've heard communication so many times as perhaps buzzwords, but um, as it's being studied, there, there is a lot of information about it out there, but there are still elements that are unknown. And another thing that is kind of unknown about it is it's unique to the person who is conducting the communication. We're all unique humans. Otherwise we would have systems that spit out this communication for us. We're still valuable in um, delivering education and delivering products to people. Every organization has the use for humans to communicate. Um, so we don't want to lose that in our approaches. Um, I found one thing that said it's quite astonishing that our research community sometimes takes communication for granted. I thought that was interesting. Um, and this was talking specifically about researchers who focus on communication and who focus on uh, the phenomena in communication. So there are some, some resources I shared on my resource slide. I tried to only include the ones that would be interesting reads for this audience um, and as we discuss our practical applications for this. Uh, correct communication is, is important and that's where the policy-based elements come in. Um, has anybody ever gotten real excited about policy? I could probably, I mean, if people are laughing, that's a good sign because that's like, oh, that's not something you think. Oh, I'm so excited about that. But um, it, is, it is exciting because it's so useful. And um, it can also provide a lot of comfort for our stakeholders. But when we first hear it, I don't know that everybody would say that we're really excited. It's kind of like, ugh might be the first reaction or, hey, I'm okay with policy might be a reaction, but it's just something that we all have to deal with in every scenario, whether we're a student, an external organization, the internal organization, a customer of something, we're all adhering to different policies all the time or carrying out different policies. So this goes back to that whole thing where you wanna get excited about things you have to do anyway, and it provides a personal fulfillment. I do want to make special mention, which I'll make one more time in this presentation about other presentations in this colloquium. I know we all have many things going on this week, but there are some really talented speakers this year and last year that talk about mindfulness um, and, and all kinds of things I think that really do relate to this topic about strategic communication. So the first part is goal-oriented and policy-based communication. There's really three parts to this. And each one will talk about ways that we can use the information to benefit our, ourselves professionally and also um, our stakeholders, which if you're an educator would be the student. If you're a student, your stakeholder will be your future um, population that you serve. And so that would be something to think about. If you're a staff member, if you're an advisory person, then your stakeholders, there are many stakeholders, but probably the main one would be the student. Um, so whenever we communicate, we always need to have a goal in mind. And so the, step, the first step in communication is to ask yourself key questions. This seems really uh, maybe cumbersome, but the more that you do this, it's a habit and you'll do it automatically. Um, yesterday, I heard Heather Frederick and uh, Dr. Thrasher talking about the habits that we get in for mindfulness, and that presentation was great. And I think that, um, that it's true for everything. So when we get in certain habits about communication, it just becomes automatic after a while, and it saves time ultimately, even though you have to put in a little bit of investment in the beginning. 
So something that we can ask ourselves, do I have feelings about this scenario? So I'll challenge you right now, think about a recent communication that you received that was frustrating or erroneous maybe, and then led to frustration, or maybe it created fear like, oh man, I have to do something about this right now. Or maybe you're just wanting to help somebody because they seem to be in distress. Or maybe you're asking for something that you really need. So this is applicable regardless, you know, what situation you're in. Um, but the first thing, as you think about the, that scenario, you can think, do I have feelings about this? Am I upset? Does this make me angry? Does this make me happy? Do I have <clears throat> a feeling of sadness for, for the scenario that I'm reading? Um, am I excited about it? Did I get some good news maybe? But because we're talking about something that caused a little bit of distress, it's probably not that. Um, and then the second thing we'll say is after we think about what, how we feel about it, how do, do I know the policy? Do we have a policy on this? And am I the right person to answer this communication? Um, what is my goal once I have decided that? So it's okay for somebody's communication to make us feel all sorts of ways. But before we respond, we have to think, what's our goal in responding to this person? What ultimately needs to happen? So the second thing that I would say is we locate the policy and the procedure or the template. I visit our university website multiple times a week to, even though I have a lot of these policies memorized that I use in my job role, I visit it all the time because it's updated a lot. Also, I wanna make sure the links are working for students for something that I'm connecting them to or another department or I want to understand another department's policy better so that we can maybe come up with a better automation to interface with them. Um, but the university policy handbook, if you are a faculty member or a student, is really important. We need to know what's in there. And often you can use that language within your own personal templates. The code of ethics is something I use all the time in my job role. Web information is important. We have so many resources online. Every university is required to provide those things. So since this is the main context is university, that's what we're talking about. But any organization will have a database with um, policies and procedures as well. So for instructors, um, the syllabi are also important. And I can't tell you how many times a student escalation or an external stakeholder escalation has resulted in us finding something that we can optimize. So sometimes these issues can be a gift that saves other people um, time in the future and provides a better experience for all of our stakeholders. So I will say that sometimes the way that we feel initially when we read something, or maybe it's really unprofessional when we when we receive something from somebody and then ultimately we might find something we could do differently. It doesn't mean that we discount the original behavior, but it does mean that we can purpose the whole circumstance for good. So this is an example. This is one of the few examples I'm willing to kind of show in this presentation. And the reason is because I, I think everybody needs to come up with their own um, templates that really work for their organization and also customize these. If I use a template that's mine, a lot of times I will say some of the same things, but I'll also make sure that if I can, I'll add something in there that's relevant for that person. Sometimes with this is a good example because with this, there's really only one or two things I can say. And so using a pretty standard template is important because I want to create equity for the stakeholder. In this case, the stakeholder is the student. And I am showing them um, compassion and caring by responding quickly with my, with my templated response that's been customized, but I'm also being equitable. We talk about implicit bias, which is a conversation for another presentation, but we talk about those things that can be built into our own practices and templates help safeguard that. We can still personalize it, but we wanna make sure that we're giving people, intentionally giving people the same answer rooted in policy every time. And it doesn't mean their situation isn't evaluated individually, but we're sending them through the standard pathways that are designed to do that. 
so that they can have the opportunity to fully advocate for themselves and so that we can advocate th uh, for equity for them by following all of our steps. This particular response is related to grade appeal. Um, if you are in education, this is a big question that we get. Instructors get it, um, faculty members get it, advisors get it. And so sometimes those, the student is really concerned or a stakeholder is really concerned or an instructor. <clears throat> and when we respond to those, um, we are demonstrating compassion for their circumstance while also making sure that we are not circumventing um, even well and you know, trying to do something good for somebody, circumventing a procedure that we have. So the last um, part of this um, portion of the presentation is to plan and construct. So we want to decide how we want to respond. We acknowledge the situation and investigate. This also goes back to, if I have to do it, what's in it for me? I'm going to make a really good go of it because I can probably use whatever I find out for somebody else to respond faster, better, have a stronger response. My templates get adjusted all the time because I find it out a new way to further explain it. If a student asks a follow-up question that was good or a stakeholder asks a follow-up question or my supervisor asks a follow-up question, I can build in to the um, general responses that we give our stakeholders so that we're anticipating questions before they ever even happen. Um, general policies should also include next steps if possible. People um, feel more valued and more empowered to do things um, and to take care of their circumstance when they understand what options are available to them. Most organizations offer many options for people to be heard and for them to get resolution for their, their problems. Um, the general requirement uh, general content can come from the internet. We can direct people to our website, and often I do that, but sometimes I go ahead and put that information in there. If it's already templated, it's easy for me to do anyway, and then there's no confusion about I can't find it. Now I'm getting more frustrated. Now I'm escalating more, and this is especially important for various types of external stakeholders. We want them to support our initiatives and our mission and our other stakeholders like students. So we really want them to be able to find the information that they need. This other element with the department handoff is really important. We all have essential roles in each of our departments. And sometimes when we are handing off a circumstance, an issue, escalation, uh, even positive things to another department, <clears throat> we must be mindful of who is in that communication, who's receiving it, how it might be received. We want to always consider that other department as an extension of our own or as a, a, joined, a joined entity, um, parts of the same body. Um, so with a student present, that's especially important. And again, since we're in the academic setting, we do talk about the students. And with the student present, that's important. And we need to be mindful of who's on the email. And also, if you are passing a student off, it is honoring them to let everybody know that they are present and who you've included and why. Um, and for the student, that's true. So if a student is watching this presentation or attending it now, then they can think, who do I want to be on this communication? Who's in the room? Who have I pulled into the room? And um, how can I apply concepts of professionalism that will benefit me now and in the future? So this goes back to department or role handoff. We just wanna really closely watch the language whenever we communicate. We wanna keep it as brief as we can. Things can be easily taken out of context goes back to um, hearing things in your voice. When you can't allow your audience to hear things in your voice, things get misinterpreted you know, extremely easily. Uh, we want to establish a unified front. If we are um, adding in language that could potentially seem like it's blaming or um, that there's like a, an issue identified in there, sometimes it can be sent separately or to a smaller group of people. This happens the most of the time when I see this occur, it's not intentional. So um, what I'm suggesting here is that we intentionally 
uh, screen our communications for those types of things. The more brief that you can get, keep it, and the more goal-oriented, what's my goal for this communication, the less the danger zone um, that you're in for creating that kind of issue in your communication. So we wanna think of all departments as roles as different parts of the same body. The right hand wouldn't harm the left hand, left hand wouldn't harm the right hand intentionally because it creates an issue for the entire body and the whole thing feels the pain. So we just wanna think about that as we move forward. If there is an issue with another stakeholder department um, for students and instructor, uh, for faculty, maybe a peer, um, then we just wanna be mindful of how we're supposed to address that issue. We can evaluate our feelings throughout the process as we did in the very beginning and think, okay, how can I respond to this to achieve the fair and equitable results in the end? You just wanna know your resources and be resourceful. Most people in their organizations can identify a resource person that's a, what I consider safe person. We really want our culture to be safe all the time to where you can be transparent with the people around you. But it's important for you, especially if you're you know, new to a circumstance to identify somebody who you can talk to and ask questions where you're not really afraid. Sometimes fear is in us, um, even whenever the person that we're afraid to speak to, um, there's not a reason to be fearful, but it's still a real thing and it still can keep us from communicating or gaining insight that we would want to have. And in this next slide, we'll just look at this and I'll open it for any initial questions or discussion on this portion that we just talked about. You might have a scenario that you thought of that you want to say something about. But um, in closing this first section, I'll say the biggest communication problem is that we don't listen, understand, we listen to reply. I think we've all done this. I have certainly done this. And sometimes when I do this, I think, oh, you know, I missed an opportunity. And so um, I like this quote for that reason. So just briefly, we'll open it up to see if anybody has any uh, comments, questions, or a, a similar scenario that resonated with them. And, and if you're still, are, yes. There are some things in the chat, but does someone just turn their mic on? Uh, if not, there are some chats that I can add. Uh, so it looks like Donna said, reminds her of the seven habits of highly effective people seek to understand then to be understood. And that's Stephen Covey. Yeah, that really is. It's a great um, book. It really is. And it does talk about that. It talks about separating, you know, how we feel from, the actions and operating as if the person is in the room is one thing that stands out to me from that book. Uh, that's important. It's not always easy to do that. And it's also not always possible sometimes whenever there are certain circumstances that you're navigating. But um, I do agree that some of these concept, concepts are very similar to those presented in that book. That's a good mention. Anybody else? Uh, yes, one more a comment in the chat box by Dr. Beeman, and she says, in Arabic, you summarize what the other person said before you reply, and so that's a very good custom. I love that. I'm actually reading a book now called I Hear You, and one of the things in there, it's about active listening and um, repeating can reduce a lot of issues. I think that's true with escalations of any kind or concerns. And truly, it's, it's time consuming when we receive those, but they are a gift because we want the feedback. We have to report on feedback in every organization. And it's also the only way that we really get better um, is to receive it and, and move forward and uh, make adjustments. Even whenever I find that whenever we have a stakeholder that's incorrect about something, we almost always find out something about our um, organization, programs, communication, something that could be adjusted to either anticipate this issue or to mitigate it or to resolve it if it's an error, if it's an actual error. So um, that's another way to look at it. Well, continue to think of your thoughts and scenarios so that we can um, discuss them here in a little bit. We will have a activity. Um, so. I would encourage you to participate in that if you uh, feel like you can. Positive strategic communication, what's in it for me? 
Um, I spoke about this a little bit at the beginning. It's okay to ask that question. I think sometimes um, we are, you know, this is a normal human question that we ask internally a lot, um, but it may be something that we wouldn't want to say out loud and that's okay. But what's in it for me? It's okay for you to want to gain your own buy-in whenever you embark on a journey for applying something, rolling something out, um, a policy, you know, you need your own buy-in in order for you to hold others to it or to ask others um, to engage with these things. So it's okay for you to internally ask what's in it for me. Here are some different um, points from resources uh, that have been useful to me and, um, and people that I know, colleagues that I know. Positive communication could be argued to rewire the brain. This is all pretty emerging. So I'm looking forward to some of the uh, research that's coming out on neuroplasticity. Um, and so I think this will become an even more important topic as we move forward. We're learning about the brain and how it changes and how our pathways change just with um, growth mindset and, and training ourselves to view circumstances a certain way. Mature gratitude was something that I had not um, investigated very heavily until recently. And that's interesting. At the end, there is a uh, resource page and um, that article is, is interesting about mature gratitude and how we can apply concepts of being thankful for different things, thanking others for things they are doing and how that changes how our brain is working and our own personal satisfaction in different scenarios. Um, we know that positive mindset is good for us. We talk about it in the healthcare field a lot, um, but it is thought to improve performance. It's thought to make us happier when we um, attempt to think positively and uh, apply strategies for that. A lot of times in one of these articles, it talks about how we expect to be happy and then everything else follows. But if we actively engage in skills that produce positive outputs, then ultimately a lot of times it will yield the happiness that we're seeking or the satisfaction that we're seeking to find. So um, I think this is the other area where I wanted to connect it back to some of these other um, subjects that have been covered this year and last year and how other speakers are touching on mindfulness and things that can provide fulfillment. So I'm looking forward to looking at those presentations again myself after the week has ended. We've talked a little bit already about templated language. Um, the great thing is that templates, once you invest all that time into it, they can be repurposed over and over. And like I said, we do need to continue to modify them. Sometimes templates are appropriate to be shared among a team. Um, sometimes they should be used for individual job roles. If you are a student, then templates should be um, very useful because there are times when you email an instructor, email a group, email a stakeholder at an organization you're seeking to do a student experience and just checking that template and making sure that all of those formal areas like the signature line and that um, certain statements, greeting statements that are appropriate for the scenario are present can make a big difference in how that communication is received and what kind of a voice they hear it in. Um, some of our communications are quick one-liners, especially uh, inter-team communication, and that's totally fine. Our teams create, have their own cultures, and we understand each other and often can read those things in the voice of the person sending it. So we have to consider the audience. Uh, we have to protect ourselves from unknowingly spreading misinformation. A lot of times, whenever I investigate a misinformation being spread, I have found that it was completely unintentional and the um, source was completely trying to resolve the issue. But um, if we use policy language, it's really hard to spread misinformation and we can continue to adjust our templates. Um, it helps us not violate policies. We found that at USU and at many universities, we have a pretty specific policy for addressing plagiarism with students. And they deserve to go through a specific, um, a, spe a specific process to be heard because sometimes it's a miscommunication or even an opportunity for teaching. So we 
um, created a, a process and automation of a, an existing policy. So it wasn't a policy change to use forms that um, instructors can use to make the appropriate notifications in those forms. It gives them next step instructions. It's a lot of steps. So it would be really easy not to follow it if we didn't have that standardized process. So for leaders in organizations, thinking of ways to automate and provide resources for the teams that you lead is important and it will help them stay compliant, but it will also help reduce the time in and kind of mitigating the damage done whenever compliance doesn't occur, which is usually unintentional. Um, we can, again, support reduction of implicit bias and we wanna make sure that we're treating everybody the same way and giving them the ability to respond. Um, so we want students have the right to be heard, stakeholders have the right to be heard, and our, um, our professional peers have the right to be heard when we have any kind of issues at hand. There's usually more to the story. All right, here is our live toolbox activity, as I like to call it. So if any of you could be thinking, um, I use student escalation for this, but we could say stakeholder escalation. If you are a student, this could also be your escalation. And think, um, what has happened if you're, if you're a stakeholder or a student, um, what has happened to cause me to feel like something needs to be corrected or adjusted? And if you are a faculty, a leader, an advisor, then you can think how, um, what has happened recently that needed to be mitigated? And what kind of communication did I receive about that? This is true in every scenario. Um, and so think about that for a moment. Uh, so here's a scenario, a stakeholder emails a university representative to seek resolution for a grading concern. This has happened for many stakeholders, not just students. This can happen from a preceptor, a site. Sometimes they receive information that we're not even able to talk to them about because students have the ability to share things. If you're a student and you're um, emailing the university to seek resolution for a grading concern, sometimes the policy is not known to the student, whether they just haven't accessed it or, or um, whatever the case may be. Um, the external stakeholder voices concerns about it. They are um, already highly upset. They, maybe they've already talked to somebody who um, did not optimally handle the circumstance. And so just imagine the scenario in your mind. Um, and then a department voices a concern about another department. That's another uh, potential scenario. So think about these things. Does anybody have a general scenario they might be able to share that we can use to work through? Um, as part of this activity. Come on, I know somebody out there has got to have a student escalation. <laughs> let's not name the student or the escalation, but let's sort of go through this process with an example, a scenario that, that Amanda can use um, to show us how to do this process. I have an example. I don't know if you can hear me. All right. Um, I would just say maybe, okay, I would just say when a student is complaining about a grade from a professor and they are currently in the course. Okay, so <laughs> this is a great example. And this does happen really frequently, I think at most academic institutions. And so the best thing to do, and it also depends on where the student is going with their concern. They might be, from the perspective of the department that knows that this student needs to wait until the final grade is posted and has to work with their professor or their instructor, um, they, we, you know, this can create feelings of, oh, this is something that we've got to uh, mitigate right now, even though we can't, like we cannot solve this immediately. For the student, the student may be really worried, really concerned. There may be all kinds of other things going on. We're, we work with nursing students in the College of Nursing who have been serving their communities. They're getting home after 14 hour shifts sometimes. Sometimes there, um, you know, there are many other external factors that are contributing to the overall stress level. But even still, even the situation in and of itself can be so um, concerning to them, especially people who are really um, seeking to be successful, that it can cause kind of a, um, even an emotional response. And that's not always true. We have people who respond very 
uh, non-emotionally to these circumstances. And it's not always bad when we have an emotional response, but we wanna talk about the productivity of it. So when somebody um, in, in an organization that requires waiting till the conclusion of the course, the first thing we're doing is how do we feel about this communication? Was it professionally written? Was it not? Either way, the goal in the end is to get the student the information they need in order to resolve their concerns. So we can provide them with information on the great appeal. I usually thank them for communicating. If it's unprofessional, I usually, you know, just kind of share with them, hey, we're really happy to help you, but, you know, we want you to remain within the bounds of code of conduct because we really don't want students to go down that road, right? Um, and then we give them the information um, from, and we can usually pull that right out of the appeals section of our catalog and put it in there, provide the link for them and say, you know, work with your instructor, but if you don't get the resolution that you feel like it needs to occur in accordance with policy, then save your information and after your final grade is posted, you can move through this process. The earlier you submit that, the better chance that we have to process that before the next term. And so then they have, they have a response that also addresses their concern. A lot of times I try to think, depending on what the student communication is, I try to provide them with some sort of conclusive statement that acknowledges them as a person. Sometimes it's the same statement that I use for different people, but you have to mean what you say if it's personal. Um, I try, even if it's a templated thing that I'm saying to, to somebody, I mean it when I say it because um, I do think that's really important when you're saying, I can tell you're, you know, it sounds like you're really committed to your success. I say that a lot. Um, and we want to help you with that. But whatever you say, think, what's, what would I say to somebody if I were encouraging them? And it is sometimes hard to do that if somebody has sent you communication that's really unprofessional or completely erroneous or blaming. Um, but if we remove how we feel about it and show, um, you know, show a goal-oriented approach, then we are able to redirect that person, give them the tools that they need, and it also demonstrates a caring action um, for that student. Yvette, uh, Dr. Lowry, thank you so much for sharing that. It's a really common scenario. Does anybody else have one? I mean, there are so many. I, I have an odd one. I don't know if it'd be an explanation, okay. but I know probably most people's examples will fall into grades, which will, we, we, which would just happen. That's why how students are mostly going to escalate for at least a faculty member. But I'm wondering, like folks in your position, does it ever escalate in the sense of um, why was not I not admitted? Like if there's some type of um, you know admission policy or or something like that. Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, occasionally universities do have pathways for exception um, for admission requirements. And I've seen this um, played out in many different capacities over the years. And I think that what's important is just to operate within the policy on that. If the university does allow for it to be um, reviewed and the review decision is rendered and there is an additional question um, as this is one of the harder things um, I would say for me personally, because I want to demonstrate a caring response to somebody. We have to keep this, this type of response very brief. Um, we, what I normally say in scenarios where people are inquiring about um, admission requirements is sometimes I'll re restate the admission requirements or I'll say, you know, at this time, um, the minimum requirements for admission are not being met and the, the decision is, and just restate the decision. Um, that is one of the hardest things to do is to provide a resolution that you know doesn't have um, much chance to be altered. And, and so it is a little bit more difficult, I would say for me in those scenarios, because you really do want to, in our, in our industry, provide pathways for people to achieve their goals. Um, so that is a tough one. I usually keep those pretty brief. If I have to respond to something like that and restate the policy, sometimes I try to um, put an encouraging thing at the end, like we do wish wish the um, applicant all the best, you know, something like that. But whatever you say, you wanted to make sure that it's within the bounds of your policy 
to be protective of your organization as well. So that is a really good example. We do have professional fears sometimes when we receive um, a scenario that we have to address. I think a lot of times fear comes from not being sure how to respond or maybe the loss of time that comes with responding um, to something that we feel like is highly escalated. Um, this can be true for students as well. If they receive a notification for something and they're not sure how to, you know, what the options are, then that can be something that instills fear, which if we operate under fear, that's where a lot of errors are made. Um, and it's hard not to do that. That's why that first step is arguably the most important to evaluate how we feel about it and whether or not those feelings translate to actionable items that must be carried out in accordance with policy. We will talk about accountability because that is important too, but I'll get there in just a moment. Here's a life toolbox solution, which is kind of what we already moved through for these different scenarios. If we're sending a written communication, um, we can follow a general template for this, but each one of these things looks different. If all of you did this on your own, which I would challenge you to do, um, whether you're a student, a faculty, an advisor, to come up with your own activity for how you might respond to something. And this would look really different if we compared all of our responses. But um, responding in this, in this format doesn't change the overall adherence to policy or even administration of accountability. We can always greet the person. We can always, almost always, <laughs> thank the person for something that they are doing um, it is difficult if there's a blatant breach in behavioral policy, that is more difficult. But we can um, thank that person for bringing a matter to our attention and sincerely mean that. Uh, we can share with them that we really do want to resolve that. I think most people could agree with that being the scenario, provide solutions or options for that person, which is policy-based we can also provide a time frame for a response. So often if I know it's gonna take me a while to figure something out, it happens to be something a little bit newer or that I haven't seen in a while, I'll sometimes say, hey, I'm gonna need some more time to look into this so that I can give it the attention that it deserves. I'll respond by, and then I make sure that I respond by that time frame, especially if it's an external stakeholder. Um, internally, we have lots of conversations so we can usually keep ourselves updated. Um, in that capacity. If it's, a, um, if it's something where they might need to take next steps, I give them clear steps. Otherwise, you might be answering several um, forms of communication to try and help that person get to that next step that you can't help them with. Um, and then if we can, we end up with some sort of supportive message. A lot of people I know have quotes even in their email taglines. That's a way to save time in doing it. That gives somebody, if it's allowable per the organizational policy, that gives the audience just a glimpse of who that person is in their general approach to things. And usually those are really positive. So, um, but I also like to end with some sort of message like, I sincerely you know, wish to support you on your academic journey, or um, it really seems like you're, you are just recognizing that they want to succeed is important because you're acknowledging that person and, and you're acknowledging that you hear that ultimately, aside from all this stuff that's in the communication, ultimately that's what it seems like they really want is it's important to them to succeed. And so we wanna give them the opportunity to uh, know what their options are at least. I like to have formal communications with stakeholders. I think it's really nice to give them a greeting if we can. To Now, as we go into further conversations, sometimes that formality changes because it's in the body of the discussion, if you will, um, but that it's error-free and formal. Okay, so there are barriers to solution discussions. What are some barriers we might encounter when we're trying to do the things we just talked about, but what kind of things might we come up against? People who are listening to reply and not to understand. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, you're, that's yeah, The person you're talking to may not be in the mindset to listen to what your solution is. Yes, absolutely. I think that's true. Um, for 
for every person involved in communication. So that's a good mention. And for um, students, I think sometimes it's that sometimes things happen occur over a university holiday or an organizational holiday or after business hours. That could be a barrier to that stakeholder communication. What else could be a barrier? It looks like some folks are putting it in the chat. So let me read some of that for you. Um, lack of understanding of the chain of command um, can be a barrier. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. And Jennifer, Jennifer, Dr. Billingsley said that. And then Chelsea Minkler, she said the, that the concern or question comes to the wrong person can be a barrier. Yes. And in all of those cases, um, you know, if, there, if there's a misunderstanding or it goes to the wrong person, which is kind of the same issue, right? Um, then we have the ability to kind of direct them. And then we have to decide, do we direct them by doing a handoff with the person present as if we are walking them down the hall or do we give them clear directions? And that's the, the answer to that is, is scenario based. So you want to decide how you do that and what the most appropriate thing to do is with those are really good examples of barriers. Sometimes the barrier, um, kind of going back to what Dr. Thrasher said and we talked about earlier is whenever somebody doesn't want to hear the solution. And when that happens and I'm like, wait a minute, I just gave them the answer. Then I think, okay, what else is going on here potentially? What else can I give this person that they might need? You can't always resolve a concern, an issue, a circumstance, um, but you can take it to the end of the policy um, opportunity trail, if you will. You can take it to the ultimate final stages of what you can offer somebody. And then you have, then ultimately you have the documentation that you did, that you did fulfill your duty. I don't really like to focus on that for this presentation because we're talking about fulfillment and service and um, you know, strategies for resolving it, but it is something we have to talk about. Ultimately, if we can't resolve something, we do have to follow policies and protect ourselves in the organization against any potential um, possibility that we did not, you know, carry out the things that we were obligated to do. And so if you're doing all this naturally, that will occur um, without even having to be as, um, when you're being mindful about how to follow policies and the, and the person that you're speaking with, then it just happens naturally. So um, group comments, I would say that uh, the things that we just talked about in the group in the comments section were definitely applicable. And those are all barriers and we probably think of 20 more as we continue on our day. Um, but ultimately we wanna be goal driven. Sometimes this is challenging. We don't want to seek to be the disciplinarian. However, some of us in our roles have the obligation um, to send uh, stakeholders through a pathway of accountability. That could be internally and externally, um, but we do allow consequences to naturally occur. If we're not in a position to hold accountability directly, um, most of the time organizations have a referral-based system, um, which we do at USU, um, to, allow, to allow situations to be fully investigated and then for the party who has been reported to be um, to be able to be heard. And oftentimes, whenever you hear the party that has been referred, there's more information that's discovered. Sometimes, um, sometimes things aren't always as they seem, but ultimately we also have a duty to our overall stakeholder and student body to hold people accountable when they're not following the rules that we all have agreed to. Um, so I'm not suggesting in any way in this presentation that we don't do that. I'm suggesting that the closer we adhere to policy, the easier it is for our committees who are responsible for that and for managers of personnel in our organization to carry out the actions that they need to carry out. We don't want to seek to settle personal disrespect. We don't like it whenever we have personal disrespect. I think that I encounter this particular scenario every week in some capacity, either um, that has directly occurred to me or supporting somebody else who it has occurred to. And um, it's very, this is a challenging scenario. It's not right whenever we don't receive um, respect in, in the communication that's being sent. 
However, um, I think it's important to address the situation at hand and then follow the pathway that we previously talked about. Um, I'm really fortunate to work with a lot of people who really adhere to these rules. And again, you want to have uh, safe people in your environment to be able to uh, talk about who are appropriate um, with when scenarios when you need insight on how to follow policy. I have to do that occasionally um, when there's something interesting going on that I haven't seen necessarily before. And so it's okay for you to identify somebody to talk with about that. You do want to make sure that you're not disclosing information that um, is privileged or confidential whenever you do that um, with somebody that shouldn't have that information. So um, do not seek to take up the cause, but allow advocacy to naturally occur based on policy. Most of the time, so I have seen this a few times where a stakeholder has a problem and we try to jump in and we try to help resolve it. I've done that myself before. And then I find out later that I did not follow, you know, a particular ideal pathway for resolution. Most of the time, these things work out just fine. However, um, we want to make sure that we're not costing ourselves time, other people time, and their stakeholders time by doing that. Um, this can happen in instructional capacities a lot. It's really tempting as a as a uh, leader in a college to see an issue in a classroom and to jump in and hold students to account or hold instructors to account without following a pathway. But we must not give into that um, temptation because we want to give it, uh, get something resolved quickly. Um, but we have to follow the pathways because like I said, sometimes you find out things during the course of allowing people to be heard that you wouldn't otherwise know. And it gives you a better, deeper insight into the scenario. There is an exception to this. If you have a mass group of people who are voicing a similar concern that start to come in, it is worth a, a um, one-off type of investigation to make sure that there's not something that needs to be mitigated immediately. So I will say there are, there's, a, um, there's an exception to that. And we always have to look at scenarios critically. We don't want to overly personalize a response. Um, sometimes if I really feel like, uh, like I need to respond to something and it's got me kind of worked up, sometimes I'll wait 24 hours if it can wait, or sometimes I'll type a response and then wait 24 hours, or occasionally I'll type a response and have my supervisor look at it and then I'll send it. Um, those things don't happen very often. I, I think that we all have a really great um, ability to navigate the, the joyful components of our job. But um, sometimes we have those moments where we do, um, you know, we do get kind of emotional in our response. And it's, it's important to really think about the goal in the end. And it happens to everybody. So if you've heard a scenario here and like, oh, I think I did that. This is not something that's unique to you. This is something that occurs everywhere and it occurs for everybody. And so um, you're not alone in, in encountering these situations. So our templates support compliance quickly. As we talked about, they encourage collaboration between departments. Here's an example of the process that I spoke about previously. Um, I, did, I only included things that were really published, but we provide some uh, faculty resources and our students definitely benefit from this because this is a caring action. This document, all these are links to portions of the document that help our faculty follow policy. The goal of that is to help faculty quickly resolve issues with plagiarism and academic misconduct, but ultimately a student, if you were a student watching this, you can think, wow, university cares for me so much that they wanted to put this in place so that I could be heard in case I was misunderstood or in case I truly wanted to share my perspective. We have had students who um, grew up learning a certain way where they were taught to repeat everything, to rewrite everything they read. And this is a habit that had to be, um, had to be broken in, in this particular con context and they had to be reoriented to the expectations of a certain program. And so sometimes you find out things that you didn't realize were um, in existence. So we wanna increase client satisfaction we allow them to be heard. We um, reassure them that we are prepared when we have an organized and timely response. There's always a next step. Um, 
we purpose everything to service other people. I found that sometimes even as time consuming as our scenarios are, they are, they can be truly purposed for good and our greatest opportunity for teaching and making a difference for people sometimes comes from really difficult scenarios. Um, this also highlights our own professionalism when we're able to respond in accordance with pathways. It also, um, as mentioned before, allows our committees to hold people accountable when there really is something going on that needs to be taken care of. Often that's separate from the um, logistical issue at hand. Policy-based communication, um, once again, is a caring action. It allows for cultural considerations, um, compassion and language barriers, uh, grace for the unknown. Sometimes we're not hearing it in the way that it's intended whenever we receive communication. And we see escalations or complicated scenarios as an opportunity to serve other people, um, even whenever there's a, a component that might be undesirable about it. This also promotes a culture of caring for our colleagues. We want to think the best of other people in other departments that they're working hard and trying to do the same thing that we are and ultimately supports the organizational mission. And think about what is your organizational mission? How might all these things discussed today help support the mission and, um, and how we put it all together? So you wanna establish a mindset, checklist, ritual, you can store all these templated things in a Word document or a Google file and establish toolkits. And um, you can resource share as appropriate, like we talked about. This is our automation form that I mentioned earlier. It's um, a public document that a student would be able to see, but this is the underside of it where we can automatically respond. So they know it was received. That's a point of stress a lot of times. And then we can adjust this if we notice there's an issue. So ultimately, we covered um, strategic opportunities. We talked about goal-oriented approaches, policy, identifying concepts for alignment, and um, how we can kind of take some of these things and make them personalized. So I could really, I love this topic. I could talk about it all day, um, but we don't have enough time for that. So um, let me know if you want more information on some of the things we've done in the College of Nursing and our specific scenario and I would be happy to talk more with you about it. Very cool stuff, Amanda. Um, I really appreciate how you have totally, in my opinion, represented today's theme of innovation and leadership. Um, the way you're using those templates is an innovative way to lead. You know, it's, a, it's an innovative way to, uh, ensure some of the, the key variables that you're emphasizing, which are one, you know, making sure you're being consistent in your message, <laughs> how many times we can say different things to different students, and then all of a sudden, um, their particular, uh, you know, response back to us is, well, you told the other students something different, and now you're trying to hold me to a different accountability, you know, so, um, and then also anchoring everything in policy, and I think that, again, was another critical theme, the whole policy adherence, you know, and, and, and communication, using those to leverage, to leverage a number of things. Um, think of the time efficiency, not having to always retire. How many times a day do you get these kinds of common, you know, things uh, from other individuals and have to rewrite that every time would wear you out? but you are not going to remember each time all the important things to cover. So one that I really liked was that checklist where you said, did I greet the person? Did I acknowledge their, um, you know, concern? Did I X, Y, and Z and even finished off? Did I, you know, uh, say thank you and et cetera. And I, I do like all throughout, there was a number of terms that, that, that you use, which I think, wow, that's really just a great way to say it. Um, and it was, you start off saying, you know, find joy and fulfillment in what you do. And, and I can tell by the words that you use throughout here, they were all words of positivity. They were words of joy and things. It's things like, let's have a solution discussion. That's such a great way to say that. Let's have a conversation about a way to solve this, right? And then nobody has to worry about being defensive. We're here to solve this right? A solution discussion is a great way to do that. You call it positive communication too, and that, that helps rewire the brain. That positive communication, because think about it, most of the time people don't send you an email to say things are great. 
<laughs> they send you an email because they need you to go do something. It could be, you know, uh, not a threat of any sort, but it could also be people who are angry. And then it does feel, um, you know, in that way. But I believe also you, you said the most important thing is when you do communication, always what is your goal? So it's goal, goal oriented. And then also what is your policy? There's a policy oriented component. And, and that really was your theme throughout. Um, and as you talked about, when even when we get a problem, so to speak, you know, in our email, we have to now put together a response that we hope meets all the qualities of things that you mentioned. Um, but to see that as a gift, it's a gift as an opportunity to improve something, to prevent another person maybe from experiencing that same thing that this person right now who just emailed me upset is experiencing. And so while we can't stop it for that person, we might be able to stop it for future people, you know, so to speak, by seeing it more as a gift and not as a uh, headache, you know. But anyway, I, you know, your whole idea of having a toolbox that's available with all of these templates that people can use as a starter and that it really is well constructed to make sure we cover everything eliminates a lot of then the follow up problems that occur when communication isn't clear and, and concise and upfront. And, and go oriented and policy oriented. Um, I, I do have a question for you, Amanda, and that is, do you ever get responses when we use these sort of templated um, starters and so forth, where people would say it sounds canned? Or I've seen I, this expression so many times, are you even reading <laughs> it or is this a, you know, an auto reply? I'm just curious about the authenticity that some people may respond to. Yeah, I, um, I actually was thinking about that this morning um, as I was preparing for this, and I have received that response maybe um, three times in the last two years, I would say, if I had to guess. Uh, it's not very often. Occasionally, somebody will say, well, this seems very, but um, a lot of times in those scenarios, it's already highly escalated anyway, or... Um, it does give me an opportunity to see if there's anything else. And, and usually my response to that is, well, is there anything that I just didn't cover that I can help you with? Maybe I missed it. And usually if there is something, they'll respond. If not, there's no response. Because I try to make sure that even if it is templated, it answers the question. But that's also where some of those like transitional statements can help, acknowledging that person and their individual circumstances and some of the things they said. Because even though the policy doesn't change across parties, um, their, their situation is unique. And so that's why acknowledging. And I think in one of the things, one of the times that happened, I was... Um, very busy, and I might not have personalized it as much. It might have been a little bit more uh, templated than it normally would have been. Um, but uh, sometimes the answer still has to be the same. And I can also tell them, even though this is pol a policy-based response, um, the pathway that you have available to you is unique to your circumstances, and you will have the opportunity to be heard. So just repeating the part that applies to them will sometimes help reduce it, their concern that you didn't really hear them. Actually, so. probably because you're the only person at this moment really using the template and they're only getting that from you. But if everybody now starts using your template, <laughs> and yeah. everybody's emails start having this standard language that ever all the other professors are emailing me the same templated language that you can see over time that it does like oh we're all using that that template and now it does give the impression that none of us are you are reading it because everybody from different professors and different students get that template that's the only thing i'd say that i was thinking through there but the other thing that i think would be magical if, if you could get this you could then retire uh, but that is, how can you take this where it's almost a prompt and, it, and, and it's, it's, do you have a greeting? And they just type into a template, you know, what is your body? Yeah. And it's going through and making sure you can even pick from some, but then when they get done, they press submit and then it drops it all into their email. Oh, that but would in, be great. But you have yeah. seven or eight templates that are predefined by the fields that you need to prompt the person in questions. And then once they fill in the template, they literally press it and it just drops it in the email and then they can press in. The technology will get that way. There probably is already stuff like that. There's probably some kind of email templates that exist and we can go in and use them. They're just not as sophisticated or as content specific as yours are. You've customized yours to your job. Yeah, I think one example, as you were talking, that I can think of where students might receive the same over and over is the plagiarism language. If they've um, been accountable for plagiarism issues in multiple classes, they would see the same email from their instructor. 
This also tells them that everybody's following the policy too. So in, I haven't had knock on wood yet because I probably have it now, <laughs> but um, I haven't had anybody complain about um, templated language with regard to being accountable for conduct or, um, or plagiarism. And so I think that's because when they see that, they're like, oh, okay, this is a consistency, which even when students are being held accountable or stakeholders or people on our, you know, our peers, we feel safer because we know that things are being done in accordance with the rules. And rules also have the opportunity for us to, you know, be heard, for all of us to be heard if everyone's following the rules like they should be. So I think Donna had a question. I I think she might have had to go, but oh, there she is. Donna, did you have a question? Yeah. yeah, I always like to take this opportunity to learn from people who are very efficient. When you write, when you have your templates, um, do you think it's quicker to keep them all in a Google Drive or in an email? Because the problem I've always struggled with is sometimes a situation would only come up maybe once every three or four months. And I would find that I would be searching five or 10 minutes for my old worded email or template. Um, is it, do you keep them in one folder? Or like, I think it was like a a table of contents that was hyperlinked. What do you recommend for efficiency? So I do several things. I'm not um, as organized as I'd like to be in this capacity. And that means just because I would like to have a master document of my own that I go to. But I say, I'd say that our teams have different shareable items that we that people who all would need that information have access to. And then also in that one document that I pulled up that had all the blue links, that's a faculty document. So it is available to everybody. And, but um, as far as my own personal responses, I don't always have time to template them right away. So I keep them, I just save the language in an email folder so that I can go back to it. Uh, myself because nobody else can access it except for me. Um, but I do have to kind of search for, for things if I need to do that. But if it's something that I've had to search for more than twice, I think, does anybody else need this? Can I put this as part of that, that um, like director's toolkit? Can I put it in the faculty guide? Um, but I do utilize my email tremendously for finding things that I've used before. That's a good question. Dr. Samendorf, this is Joanne Bruno. I keep a Word doc on my desktop related to USU plagiarism policy. Inside the Word doc is the entire uh, process procedure, plus the example wording that you placed in there. And, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I will email that to the faculty member if and if they don't already have it, and many times they do not. And uh, the step-by-step -step guidelines are very clear that um, this is a suggested wording, um, and faculty will copy and paste that into a communication for the student, and they'll modify it as needed. Many times I'll get a, a BCC email and I see that faculty are using it and they are modifying it to the individual student uh, situation. However, the key components of the process we use are always there. So we ensure that the policy is um, being implemented and that each student is being treated equitably, fairly. Um, and I think that's really important. It has saved faculty a tremendous amount of time. Me too. I really have appreciated it so very much. Um, I also wanted to comment on the positivity piece uh, in addressing these concerns. Occasionally, you'll you'll get an email from a faculty or a student who is quite upset about an issue, and I think in concert with our um, caring science philosophy that we have integrated throughout our curriculum, I always first respond uh, to the individual by saying, um, I uh, thank you for your email. I hear your concerns. And this is an acknowledgement. I hear you. 
and I think mm -hmm. uh, when someone reads, when a student who's upset reads that, you know, I think they they seem to be quite appreciative that uh, that's all they want. They want to be heard. And yeah. so uh, I think as a faculty, we have to keep the mindset that we're here to help and serve you as a student, as a faculty member. You know, we're not here to criticize you. We're here to help you. And if we can develop that mindset of uh, the fact that when people do reach out to us, they have a legitimate reason for doing so. They want to be heard and they want to be treated with uh, in a caring fashion. You know, the old uh, authoritarian type of leadership is completely out of date in the 21st century. You know, we really have to go move toward this transformational leadership. And uh, it's it's about a we philosophy. And, you know, we really are here to help you and serve you. And I, I just wanted to make that comment. That's great. I, I totally agree with that. And I think what you said is important, like uh, no matter what kind of what kind of communication we receive, even when somebody is even doing the wrong thing or behaving inappropriately, sometimes I have to remind myself that is there a way that I can demonstrate I care for this person without uh, validating their misbehavior, you know, and that's something that we have to do when we um, lead in our in our, um, in every capacity of life, you know, but especially as we're modeling things for our students who will be future leaders and educators, and they deserve that from us, they deserve to be um, held to account, but also, you know, if we can do that while, while demonstrating caring, like the ultimate goal, even when we correct somebody is that they'll do better, you know, that they will um, do the right thing the next time. And so I'm glad you brought that up, Dr. Gruno. It is sort of why we're here, right? Always to do what we can to help the student. We, you know, we become educators for that reason, regardless of your content area that you teach. And if you're at the university, you're an educator. You may also be a nurse and a business owner and a counselor and everything else, but your role here as you interact with students is an instructor, an educator. And it is the philosophy of an educator to say, I'm here with you side by side to walk this journey with you and help you. Um, the student has to also be willing to let you walk beside them and help them and give them feedback. And we know sometimes that's the struggle. But um, I believe once you sort of put yourself in other people's shoes and we don't always know what their life is like, they may have a whole bunch of stuff going on in their day. And sometimes getting a discussion question done before midnight is not the greatest priority. Um, and then they may get angry tomorrow because we took points off and now they want to come into this whole scenario where you have to start now responding to them and redirecting them and acknowledging and et cetera, like, like, uh, um, uh, like uh, Amanda was saying, but, but that created, you know, that now energy has to be spent on something um, when sometimes a template may have prevented the follow-up and et cetera. So I hope this was all useful. I found it to be extremely useful on, seeing how Amanda leads um, her unit, you know, and how she interacts with students and peers and colleagues, and, and more importantly, how she, like she said, leverages, leverages communication and policy adherence in order to influence the recipient of that message, which is the definition of leadership, right? Um, Amber, I think you have a fascinating background there. It looks, you almost look like a renaissance. Uh, it looks like a halo type thing here behind you. Probably get that live. I was trying to figure out what that what it was, but I think it's a clock or something. Anyway, okay. In about 45 more minutes, we're going to have um, the last colloquium presentation of today. And it will be on how high school teachers have responded to the sudden shift, again, this concept of innovation and leadership, the sudden shift that they had to go through um, during the pandemic where everything all of a sudden went online. And we're gonna see what, what they have to say from that research. Thank you all for showing up and we'll talk to you soon. I'll send the recording around um, probably by tomorrow morning. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.